Education Coordinator at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts, joined by um, Emily Schlemowitz and Jamie Henry, uh, if you would like to introduce yourselves. Uh, sure, I'm Emily Schlemowitz. I'm the exhibit curator at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts, and I've been with the museum for about uh, almost two years now. So. Hi, uh, I'm Jamie Henry. I am the previous, previous exhibit curator for the museum, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Currently, I am the historic site manager for the Missouri First State Capitol State Historic Site in St. Charles, Missouri. Yay. All right, so if during any of this presentation you have any questions you would like to ask us, um, feel free to do so by popping up the chat screen at the bottom. Um, so hover over the Zoom screen and click chat, it'll pop out to the right, and um, you can ask the panelists any questions you'd like. Um, along with that, you can do so on Facebook too, and our director, Melissa, will be transferring those questions over to us. Um, so we'll be talking about textile display, both in museums and in your homes. Um, so we'll start talking about textile display at the museum first. So we're gonna start with Jamie telling you a little bit about um, the history of textile display and how he started transforming and changing that display uh, to be more dynamic. Sure, uh, let me make sure I unmute myself. So I came to the museum in, I believe it was 2015. Uh, I think it was fall 2015. And the first thing that kind of struck me about it was the gallery space. Uh, it's in, you know, a, restored barn. Uh, and so it was a little bit daunting to think how are we going to fill up all that space um, from the outside. When I got there, I can't remember the name of the exhibit, uh, but it was animal themed. And I think there was about 115 pieces of fiber art up in it. Uh, and it was just kind of like awe inspiring. So I believe throughout most of the early history of the museum, that was kind of what the main idea was to have all of these different types of fiber arts and bring in all these different types of examples and the numbers were kind of overwhelming. So one of the first things that I kind of started to work on when it came to developing the exhibits into a more uh, concise narrative was to determine how many pieces of artwork we could hang safely and, and at a position where people could actually view them. Because as you get more and more pieces, you have to find more space for it. And usually that space was up. Uh, and the higher things get, the harder it is to see them. Uh, and so the first thing that I worked on was El Baul de Mi Abuelita, um, where we had two artists. And I think each one contributed about 30 pieces. And so we brought it down from about 115 pieces to 60. And then the following exhibit, uh, the number that we shot for was about 35. And I think that's kind of the number we use today at the museum. Um, the 35 is just a good count to cover the majority of the wall space, keep everything at like a level low enough so that you don't have to crane your neck really hard to see things and also makes it so that when you see the pieces, they're not um, kind of blending in with everything around them. And so that was one of the decisions that we made early on. And I think it's stuck. Um, obviously certain exhibits, especially the, um, some of the, the ones where we, where we get things um, like the Biennale and things like that, where we're taking a lot of submissions, that number might creep up. But in general, I, I think, um, getting the number down was really important just to make it easier for people to see the pieces uh, and then also to keep them uh, not overlapping each other. Yeah, you're right. We definitely keep it to about 30 to 40. Um, sometimes we, depending on the work, we go up to 50, 55 is kind of our max. But then for the biennial, um, this year we had a hundred and over a hundred um, and then spilled into the entryway, which is something that we're trying to do more of um, activating entryway space so that um, when you first come in, you have, you see art. Um, so. 
Yeah, and I remember too, at least originally, it was kind of a challenge to kind of re uh, educate the visitor coming in to not expect that many things. Um, and obviously using the space, use, utilizing more of the space like in the entryway like you were just describing was something that we were working towards. Um, and I think the one on the left is from the hexagon exhibit. Uh, and that one I think we had under 30 pieces in that one, um, which was kind of a lower one. Oh, sorry. I was just going to start talking about hanging, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, and I believe uh, early on with a lot of them, it was finding the spaces that were good uh, viewing like lanes so that you wouldn't run into issues of uh, pieces obscuring other pieces, uh, but also kind of creating a way to make the space unique for each exhibit. So you wouldn't hang things in the same spaces every single time um, because each time people come back, you wanted them to kind of experience it in a new way. And I think that was another thing that started changing around the time that I was getting there where uh, they had been talking about utilizing different areas of the barn to hang. Um, and then also they had started using, not started using, but they had the tracks that Devin was going to talk about with the wires that you can kind of see in the pictures um, where those ones where they look kind of like they're floating. There's actually a track up there uh, that's has a wire that hangs down and I'll let Devin kind of talk about that. Yeah, so one of the things that the museum started doing with um, when Jamie started was dropping the pieces lower and involving to involve dropping those pieces lower. We went from uh, what you'd call alligator clips. So things that were right along the top of the quilt to hang them up in those tracks to getting um, J hooks and wires that allowed us to um, lower the quilts to an uh, eye level. So all the display now are at that eye level so that you're able to see just about the center point of the quilt or other textile and then it goes up and down from there kind of balanced to based on your eye level. Um, different curators have balanced that differently, like Emily is very much a measurer, so she would start by measuring to that exact center point and then plotting one piece and going eye level from there. Um, whereas others have just used, like I, one of the exhibits, we leveled everything based on the bottom of the quilts. So um, that one was a lot of large quilts and it was a quilt, um, quilt Nihon, that was the exhibit. And we leveled everything on the bottom. Um, but for the most part, everything is hung at eye level so that you as the, the visitor can experience the art um, up close. And so we use a multitude of different things. A lot of things are kind of jerry-rigged specific to us um, because hanging quilts the way that we do is unique to uh, quilting institutions. So we use a lot of what we call J-hooks. So the top of them is shaped like a J and then the bottom is also shaped like a J. And the bottom piece is mobile up and down um, on these thick metal wires. And the hooks themselves can carry about 30 pounds of weight. Um, so depending on how large or small your quilts are, we might have to use multiple hooks um, in multiple areas with slabs. Um, and then the wires themselves can hold about 150 pounds. So it's varying that between how heavy a quilt is. Um, in some cases, different, like we may run out of those. So we have learned how to function without using those J hooks um, by using S hooks and picture hangers. Um, the picture hangers, I tend to invert and use that as the top hook and then run um, fishing line or um, other clear wires through them, depending on how we want to hang pieces. So in the, on the next slide, you can see um, some pieces where we've used the J hooks. So you can sort of see the wires hanging from them, but pretty much they're all free hanging. Um, and that was started with Jamie. Do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, uh, I can't remember exactly when we started getting them, but I remember that 
they did make it a lot easier to level because you could do it after it was already up, which when prior to that with the gator hooks and not using kind of like a dowel and a sleeve on the back, you would run into an issue where um, <laughs> if you eyeballed it, the wall was misleading, so it might come out crooked. And then also the other thing that you would run into is if you use the hook at one part of the quilt, um, depending on how the quilt would kind of sag with it, it just might look a little bit more wrinkled. So when we started using the slats and dowel rods and things that I think Devin will talk a little bit more about, to do it, it kind of stiffened up the top line, which made them hang a little bit cleaner. And it also made them easier to light because you wouldn't be getting more and more shadows on them. Um, and then also it was a lot easier to move them because instead of having to move all of the apparatus with the clips and all that kind of stuff over, you can slide the J hooks in the, um, in the, the rails or whatever up at the top. Uh, and those, uh, actually hold a lot of weight. Devin, like Devin mentioned that the clips hold about 30 each. So if you put two of them on, it's going to hold about 60 pounds, but the, but the actual, um, rails up at the top can hold something, I think like 250 pounds. So they can suspend quite a bit of weight, um, which was reassuring because you never, the worst thing that can happen is one of them just kind of go and fall. Um, oh, that, which, that's a nightmare. I mean, with yeah. quilts, it's not so scary because they're going to land pretty soft, but yeah. um, when you move into different art pieces. Uh, that, oh yeah. Especially if they're awkward and you don't know which, if, usually the part that's the most, uh, Fragile is probably going to hit first, so. Always. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and they did a really good job kind of picking where all the, um, all of the different spots would be to put the tracks. That's okay. the word I for tracks. Um, they put them in good spots where you could really make use of the space, even if there wasn't kind of like a back wall like you're seeing there where they're kind of suspended. Um, and like I was mentioning before, that kind of helps you set the path of the exhibit. So if you wanted that to be an open walkway, you could, or like they did there, they kind of closed it off so that you had to walk around them or see a certain part of the exhibit first, which uh, is a pretty useful tactic when you want people to kind of progress through the exhibit in zones or different parts of the narrative, uh, which, you know, with most of the exhibits now, especially as you're working with artists, there's probably some intent by the artist to um, tell some kind of story and you can do that through the movement through the exhibit. I think the uh, next slide just shows different um, textiles that can be hung in the same way using those uh, slats and um, J hooks or in some cases S hooks and um, Fishing line. Um, what's the fancy word for that, Emily? Oh, um, monofilament. Monofilament. <laughs> she always makes me sound smarter. <laughs> it, it's fishing line, but it sounds so much better to say monofilament. Um, so in some cases, it is a hybrid of those two things. So the piece um, on the left in the picture is both using J hooks to hold the piece itself and then um, there was a piece supposed to be displayed out in front of it and that is using the tracks up on the top and then fishing line to make it disappear into the background. Yeah. And then in some cases we, um, with Emily starting, she, her husband and her have, do you want to talk about your running of lines? Oh, sure. So then again, we started thinking about how to activate the space and when you first walk in and um, how one of the way, one of our solutions was to run uh, aircraft cable the length of the atrium space so that we could use that as a hanging mechanism um, within the space. And so that we first tried that with Akiko Ike uh, and her fish. Um, so we had three fish uh, hanging from the ceiling uh, when you first walked in and the that related to what was happening in the gallery. So 
the show was water. Um, so you immediately came in and sort of felt the feeling of water. Uh, and then that one, we always <laughs> utilize husband Phil because he's tall. Um, <laughs> Very that's tall. In my letters. <laughs> Uh, so you can see him installing that work there and I think I think moving forward we'll continue to explore how to do that and um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end uh, but it was a it was a cool effect <clears throat> and the nice thing about the aircraft cable is that it just kind of disappears you don't really see it uh, once it's up so um, you really only the see same, yeah it was the same thing with the, the wires and the J hooks too. Um, you can see them if you look for them, but they almost disappear into the background of the barn structure, which is really great for us. Um, those J hooks come in a multitude of different varieties. So uh, the ones that were chosen by Jamie, et cetera, um, they can hold a certain amount of weight, which is what we needed for the quilts, but they also do come in clear varieties, but those ones hold less weight and um, they are kind of like the um, monofilament, but a lot of art museums or gallery spaces will use the clear ones because they're putting them directly up against a, a white wall and you don't want a large silver cord showing in that capacity. Um, in some cases, like on the three pieces on the right, we actually did something different with our cables than usual. We were able to take off the bottom parts of the J hooks and Put multiple hooks onto one cord and that allowed us to hang similar pieces like that's one that's a set of three and we're allowed oh sorry I'm looking at my screen <laughs> so that allows um, that allowed us to hang them exactly parallel with each other but also hanging from the same cord so that cord like I said can hang about 150 um, pounds and each of the hooks themselves can hold about 30 so they're safe to hold each of those pieces. Um, those quilts are probably not 30 pounds, but it, it does create um, a distinct way of hanging them so that we could hang them um, cleanly. Otherwise you would have three different lines that hung from the top and you would definitely be able to see them all hanging there. Um, and then the one on the right, which is currently on display at the museum with our current exhibit um, on the left, sorry. Uh, the Linda Marcus mask. So that one is hung using the um, wire and S-hook cables. Um, and that was because we wanted it to look like a mask, otherwise you would have seen about 10 cables hanging from the top and it would ruin the experience. Yeah, they really just It really disappears. It's really effective. And then since we don't just have quilts, um, sometimes it's coming up with creative ways to hang and display pieces using those different wire tactics. So um, the strawberry was hung using the fishing line along with that kite, both of those um, the same way with the hook on the top and then running through the piece and then back up to the top to secure them. Um, and the same with the two ladies on the right and then the The paper piece was used um, by securing it directly to the wall, which also hides. And then we talked about sleeves. So almost all of our pieces have some form of sleeve and that's to hide the slat that then attach to the J hook. So um, our slats are almost always just a piece of wood. Um, and then the wood has two eyelets, one on each end, and that is where the hooks of the um, J hooks adhere. So um, that makes for a very clean hanging and you're able to tuck the tail of the cords that hang down into that sleeve. Um, the sleeves are about double the size of your slat and we make sure it has, it's a whole pocket. So it's a whole roll of uh, fabric because you don't want the wood of the slat touching onto the quilt itself. So like a half slat doesn't work in our case because it would, um, the wood is still brand new, so it could off gas and damage the quilt. Um, the slats are, or the, the sleeves themselves are whip stitched onto the piece going through um, only the backing usually, but if um, sometimes 
that allows for, um, if your piece isn't quilted and it's just a front piece and a back piece, if you're only going through the back of the quilt, um, what's called pillowing can happen. So your piece won't hang straight because nothing has tied the front and the back together. So that's just something you need to uh, be careful of when you are putting slats on your pieces or slats and sleeves if you're using that method onto your pieces. Uh, yes, so we whip stitch them and we make sure we're catching multiple pieces of um, the fibers into each stitch. So it's not just holding onto one of the fibers of the back. Uh, and then, you know, when we get an, when we get work in um, for an exhibition, we spend a lot of time measuring. Um, we do a condition report uh, immediately, and Devin will will normally do that and take a picture of the work or do a drawing of the work. Uh, and then our wonderful volunteers will come in and help us measure the the, the pocket for the for the slat. And uh, you can see that we take lots of measurements. They're very exact. Um, and we have, a, we have an, a nice inventory of slats. So that really allows us to pretty much utilize what's ever in our inventory. Um, but you'll see this is a piece that's just come in. We put it on a white sheet so that it doesn't get dirty. Uh, we wear our gloves, which I think we'll talk about later. And, uh, and then we do a condition report. So sometimes when we display pieces, um, the slat method and the sleeve method doesn't, won't work for the piece, whether it's because it's very fragile, like it's made of silk, or we want a, a more dynamic uh, display. So uh, we're going to let Jamie talk about his Henry VIII dress. Yeah, and um, right around this time, we had done an exhibit called um, coverlets and Stephen graphs. And Dick, one of the wonderful volunteers, uh, helped us engineer the kind of slant boards that you're seeing there uh, to hold the, um, they were in frames, the Stephen graphs were in frames. And right after that, we were following up with an exhibit on, on folk arts, folk and fiber. And one of the pieces was this, uh, I'm going to call it a, a cape jacket <laughs> um, that, that depicts Henry VIII. And, all. and when we had originally decided we wanted to use it, um, I wasn't sold on hanging it because, as you can see, when it's on the mannequin or the dress form, it just kind of drops. It doesn't flare out like we wanted it to. And so we looked into using a table, but because the table would have been flat and the way that the gallery is with the little step up on the, on the sidewall, um, it would have been really hard to actually see it unless it was at an angle. And so we looked into ways to hang it, but it was so heavy that we knew that it would get damaged if there wasn't something kind of distributing the weight evenly. And when we looked at the slant boards, they just kind of were at a good angle to take enough of the weight and then we could kind of pin to make sure that it didn't move. And with the hanging and the arms out, it really just kind of gave this, like Devin called it a dramatic effect where you got to see it and you could see how it looked just kind of great. And that was just a happenstance with a conversation that I had with Devin's predecessor saying, well, if we hung it and we, you know, distributed the weight, would that be okay? Um, and then just kind of working through it. The, the cool part about this, and I think Devin has a picture of it a little bit later, um, in tandem with that, we actually had a hooked rug in the show of the Holbein, um, I think it's Holbein, his uh, the portrait of, of Henry VIII. And so they kind of were facing off um, the one portrait is him kind of stoically standing there. And then this one is him uh, surrounded by his, his ex-wives um, to kind of give a, a little bit of a, um, show an interesting way that he, he is being depicted. 
Uh, but what was great about that was using the dowel through the sleeves, it kind of set the top level. We could, you know, move it up or move it down. Uh, but it also provided enough support in the sleeves with a rigid dowel going through to where those weren't going to droop and it wasn't going to sag one way or another, which, you know, over the course of a, I think it was like a four month exhibit over the course of a four month exhibit could really harm something like that if it wasn't properly supported. Um, and I will say Devin mentioned that you have to tuck the excess wires into the sleeves um, and that is with varying degrees of success because it can be super frustrating if you have a lot of slack to try and get that in there um, just because it's a metal wire. So if it doesn't want to go a certain way, it's not going to. Yes. Yes, definitely. Those wires are finicky uh, at best. So um, another way that we've used dowel hanging um, is when a piece is really fragile and we can't attach a sleeve to it. So just like that dress cape, tunic, whatever appropriate word is for that um, outfit, uh, the two pieces here, uh, the one on the left, the black shawl, was not something that we could put a sleeve in because it is double-sided. So um, we actually used a dowel uh, so a rounded dowel where we put the eyelets on the end, just like we do for all of the other ones for hanging with the J hooks. But then we covered that dowel in quilting batting and then um, a black um, cotton fabric to protect the piece and to, uh, to disappear into the background in case any of it showed. And that was to protect the piece so that we weren't putting any creases in it um, because it was, it was very fragile and it would um, possibly wrinkle if we put it on something that was square. Um, and the one on the right was made of silk. So it's just combating that um, fragility of a piece by using a different but similar display method. And then one of the things that we've thought about a lot um, has been how to display smaller work, smaller quilts. Uh, so we introduced a new system um, of scrim, and these are actually just theatrical scrim. I ordered it from a, a theater company, um, and I chose it because I thought it looked kind of the natural weave, um, and it was relatively affordable. And, and then they, they actually sewed the pockets, so it really came pretty much pre-made, and then we just put in... Um, wooden slats um, on the bottom and the top. And that allows us to really create these temporary wall systems, which allows us to show smaller work. Uh, so you can see the effect here. Um, and sometimes we do show a larger quilt um, spanning two of them. Uh, again, thinking about you know how to create a room within a very large room. The barn is, can be a little bit massive. It's a beautiful space, um, but this, this provides some intimacy um, for looking. Uh, so. And you can see again, the effect that has when, you, when you're looking across the gallery space. The picture is a perfect segue because we can talk about some of the other fiber arts that are um, some of the other display methods that are used for fiber arts. So um, in that picture, you saw that there were there was a, um, a stand that we had one of the pieces on. So not only do we display pieces um, hanging, but not all fiber art is something that can be hung. So we also use slant boards um, to display pieces, vitrines and cases, dress forms, um, and framing where we pin objects to those frames. So often slant boards are used um, in cases where the quilts or the textile are very fragile or um, they can't have a, if they do have a sleeve on them, you can't go all the way through them. So the piece on the very left, that um, goldish tan quilt, that one is completely made of silks and um, those silks couldn't be sewn all the way through without showing some of the quilting. The pieces themselves weren't actually quilted. There was a backing piece and a front piece, 
and then so the front was pieced and the, the back was on there to cover um, any of the stitching that was gone through with all of the beautiful embroidery that's put on the front so the sheer size of that one it was unable to be hung because it wouldn't support um, the sleeve on the back so that one was put on a slant board and supported using pins uh, to keep it in place and then the one on the right which is currently on display at the museum and our treasures from the vault exhibit um, is put on a slant board because it is too it is too old and damaged to be hung if we were to hang it um, it would rip and uh, get destroyed. And then the tiny one in the middle is a display piece that I made for the Native Fibers exhibit, which is made out of um, acid-free board and quilting batting. So one of the great things about working at a quilt museum is how much fabric and batting you have access to because you are able to create almost anything that you could ever want to make for protection of pieces. So we always have access to batting. We always have access to cottons and muslins. Um, for the safety of pieces on display. Uh, occasionally we do, we do use vitrines. Um, we don't actually own uh, vitrines. Um, these we borrowed from the they were very, uh, Cedarburg Cultural Center was very kind and lent them to us. Uh, but we also, we do own cases, uh, glass cases. Um, so you can see we paint the vitrines. We do try to, I do, um, we paint the pedestals. I do try to switch out the colors um, periodically to match the sort of the theme of the show. Um, but <clears throat> when we're planning the cases, typically I'll work uh, downstairs on sort of an initial plan. Um, so you can see here, this is me, a schematic for what's going to go upstairs. And then we started utilizing these velvet, this is velvet on the left um, covering but foam core. Um, so basically we just covered foam core with velvet and that allowed us to uh, pin the lace down. Um, so you can see we've added in some uh, number pins for the label, but also uh, some pins that disappear so that someone couldn't pick it up um, off the pedestal. Uh, so, right, Devin, do you want to add to that? Oh, yeah. So when we're talking about um, pinning pieces, it's not only so that they don't walk off, it's so that they don't move around and we can keep them displayed where we'd like them. So when we use pins, we're not using like the normal quilting pins where they have the colorful tops and the fancy designs. It's almost always the steel, um, or not, yeah, it's the, the completely metal pins that you can push into the backing. Um, and I go in between fibers so that I'm not uh, breaking any of the, the delicate fibers. It's usually done on pieces uh, that we might hang, which you'll see a picture of me pinning some later. Um, so even the, the, uh, the standing mount there is actually pinned on to make sure that the fans don't blow them away and that we keep them where we want them to be. Yeah, and then in this picture, I just utilized some um, plastic pieces. They were, I think they were actually used typically in our gift shop uh, to just give us some elevation. Um, and these were meant, the, these cool boxes are actually meant to look a bit like wedding cakes. That's kind of their intention. Um, and so you get that feeling of being, you know, seeing a wedding cake display. Um, and you can see that more too here. This is it installed um, on the left. Mm -hmm. That's all the way in the back corner. Um, and then another way that we display art, is fiber art, which, you know, a lot of fiber art is clothing. So we do have dresses and jackets and that tunicky outfit and it all depends on what the piece itself wants to tell and what story it needs to tell. So on the left those pictures are of two dresses that were created to look like teepees or uh, dwellings. So to make them hold the shape um, dress forms don't usually have shoulders so it was a lot of working inside to using batting and backing and um, different fiber-based armatures to 
create the shape of a human and make the dress look like it was supposed to. And then the wedding dress on the right, uh, because it is on the ground, we wanted to make sure that it was protected from the floor. So there's actually a piece of um, cotton underneath it to make sure that the object isn't directly touching the floor. And then sometimes the mounts themselves are just backing pieces. So this one was used to show how um, the bag should have been worn by a male. So we don't have a lot of male dress forms, but we do have at least one. Um, so things that we can do to cover those, otherwise they're you know, a multitude of colors like dress forms come in. I think we have red and blue, and this one I think is a weird brownish color. So in order to offset that from the piece, we decided on a black cotton t-shirt and then covered the top with some cotton fabric. And then just a display of some other pieces that we've put on dress forms. Uh, that was from our, our digital exhibit. And then here's going into the pinning a little bit later. <laughs> so there's me pinning all of the pieces. Um, so different display techniques can be like um, hanging of those velvet boards. So the pieces on the right, the molas, are currently on display at the museum, um, but they are pinned to that board so that we can um, show them not laying down. Um, so it's pinned evenly about an inch apart along the top to support the fibers so that they don't pull and rip. And then it's also pinned along the sides and the bottom to make sure that uh, those are supported and they can't be ripped off. Along with the, the lace itself, how it was hung, we had um, some frames and then we used poster board that we covered in cotton again and then we pinned directly to that. Um, it got a little treacherous in the back. You could, if you grabbed onto the board, you could get pinned. So uh, make sure you have your tetanus shot. <laughs> <laughs> So there are a different, like a ton of different varieties of hanging. Uh, the one that we predominantly go with, like I said, was the, the slant or the, well, we do use slant boards, but we also use the sleeves and the um, dowels or rods um, with the eyelets on the end. But there are a variety of different ways that you can hang quilts and different places and different museums use different um, techniques. So you can clamp them. Um, clamp boards like the one shown here are advancing so they used to have all of the little turn knobs on the front and now they are creating them with um, allen wrench pieces that you can put in the back so it has this clean front finish um, you can also do velcro um, the museum doesn't use velcro because i personally am not a fan of it it does support the piece um or the side for me Emily. But that Velcro does support the piece evenly across the back, but Velcro inherently has hooks and we're working with fiber art. So there's always, when working with Velcro, that possibility of damage and to negate that possibility of damage is why I don't use Velcro in any of our pieces. Um, also Velcro is often has some sort of um, plastic backing and that plastic does deteriorate over time. But some different ways that individuals have found to hang or like instead of just doing the sleeve are little loops to create that um, cuteness for hanging or you can use like um, clips for you know, window coverings also you know cute corner pieces all right and then then we talk about lighting jamie would you like to talk about changing the lighting structure at the museum yeah so if you've been to the gallery uh and i'm assuming it's still the same with the tracks that are hanging the sun so when i first arrived that had been installed um and the lights that they had were they had um they had lights that were a warmer temperature um and it's counter for me it's always been counterintuitive with lighting where the warmer te temperature is actually a cooler color so the warmer the light it's actually closer to a blue or a white light and usually i say that that's like if you've watched any procedural cop show when they go to the morgue that kind of sterile blue lighting um that's what it is and so it doesn't do much for the colors and since a lot of the fiber arts are 
you know, color is very important to the overall aesthetic of the piece, you want it to be as true to that color as possible. And so usually to do that in lighting, you want it to be as close to natural light, which is a warmer temperature. And so I think within the first year or two, I was there about 18 months. So within the first year, we had met someone and they had offered to donate some bulbs um, that were a much warmer or much cooler temperature. So it would be a warmer color light. And the just the difference was immediate where something would look washed out or it would look like it had faded in the older lights. And then it would just completely pop and, you know, look like it was brand new in the newer ones, which gave a lot of real good benefits. The additional thing was they gave us two different so floods versus kind of spots. And so that's like the arc of the light with a flood, it'll cover more area um, and be a little bit more diffused. Whereas a spotlight will be more exactly like it says, just kind of like a hotter spotlight. And so getting those two different ones allows you to kind of play with how you're lighting different areas. And um, with only having the tracks in the center, in most art galleries, they'll have a square so that you can move the fixtures around to get better coverage depending on how you lay out the exhibit. With the linear tracks, you don't have that. If there's more things on a wall that's further away, you can't move fixtures closer. You have to try and get the light uh, to hit it more evenly from further away, which can often be a challenge. And like you can see in the pictures with the rolly ladder, um, which I had a lot of fun times with because I'm not great with heights, uh, but with that, it makes it a lot easier to kind of move them up and down. And then depending on where the pieces are, you kind of choose the light that you want in order to get the effect that you want. Um, and then as Devin will tell you and any good collections person will tell you, you also want to monitor, um, how much light is hitting it because fabric and dyes are very, very, um, susceptible or susceptible to light damage. Um, and especially with older textiles, you really have to watch that because if you have something up for too many hours under that light, it can just fry the colors out. And then even though it looked great while it was hanging up, when you pull it down, you can see damage um, from the colors deteriorating or even the pieces themselves deteriorating. Okay. So light levels in museum is kind of a, a give and take. So most museums you go into are very dark and I'm sure a lot of you wonder why because those objects would you, you want to be able to see the objects that's the whole reason you're going to a museum but museums have to play between are we protecting the object and are we showing the object. So our museum for our, our pieces never go above um, 10 when we're displaying textiles. The preferable level for light is 7 um, but that gets really dark and I get a lot of complaints. So they're only up for a maximum of three months. And so we we go between that seven and 10 light level. Um, I think we're at a six something in that picture. Uh, and then like Jamie said, we have those two different kinds of lights. What he bought were all LEDs. So that decreases the amount of harmful UV um, showing on your pieces. So we don't have to worry about the UV damaging our pieces uh, with the LEDs, but we do still have to work within that light structure. Um, so we often use those big floodlights. Um, the closer you are to something with a light, the more, uh, the higher the light level is just because of its concentration. So with those big floodlights, we have to move them back until we hit that set, set light. Uh, so yes, I'm still using math. <laughs> but we often use those on the floor to bounce light up and hit the bottom corners of quilts to make sure that we're evenly lighting pieces and so that you can also see while you're walking around the space. Um, but it is it is a, a play between the two light and we're always gonna err towards protecting the pieces. And so that's why our light levels are always between seven and 10. Yeah, and I will say um, the other thing to consider is there's a lot of light noise or pollution for uh, with a lighting system like that, where if things, if the lights are above the level of where you're hanging the quilts. So depending on the angle that you're going to put it down, 
depending on how tall the person is, it can hit them in the eyes differently. So that was always something that I had to be really aware of. I'm not super tall, um, but I am, I'm like six feet tall. And so if we have somebody that's my height that comes in versus somebody that is shorter or even taller, the angle that works for me isn't going to work for everybody. And that is another thing to consider, especially as you lowered the quilts down, you exposed more of the tracks. Uh, or if you lower the artwork down, um, any type of artwork, or if you don't have those scrims like you guys were showing, you would run into issues where there might be some light pollution coming around the side that you wouldn't have had normally. Um, and that also kind of informs the way that you're going to lay something out, which... Yeah, we, yeah, we have had sure. some lights on one side, like that picture on the left where you can see it, like you're staring and you're looking at one quilt on one side and the light from the other side is completely blinding you. So we've had to adjust the lighting based on blinding. Also, we've done it to the people at the, the volunteer desk before and they've asked us mm -hmm. to change those. So um, we do take recommendations when... Um, if we do miss something. Yeah, and I will say the other thing is it's always better to light with somebody else there because there's nothing more frustrating than being up on the ladder, lighting something, moving the ladder, looking at it, and then realizing it looks great from up there, but then down on the ground, it just looks like you are casting a giant shadow. Yeah. Yep. All right, so... So what is the biggest challenge, do you think, for display? Either Emily or Jay. <laughs> so what do you think is one of the biggest challenges for displaying in the barn? When I worked there, and I don't know if you still have this, but the constant was a squeaky fan that people always complain about. Um, <laughs> But for me, the, the, at least coming in initially, because a lot of my exhibit schedule the first year I was there was already set, but I hadn't met any of the artists that I was going to be displaying with. And for me, the hardest part always was finding the kind of like base narrative thread that was going to go throughout um, in order to figure out where things were going to go. And so as I was there longer and we started getting into exhibits that weren't just, um, you know, weren't just like larger shows of 20 different artists, which I think sometimes it's easier to kind of do those because then you can put all of one artist's work together and it kind of leads you as you put it together. But working with one artist or two artists or under five and then figuring out if there's a unique narrative where you're gonna put the pieces together um, like a puzzle, that was always difficult for me just because there was a lot of conversations that needed to be had uh, about what the point of the exhibit was and how each artist kind of fit into it. And so that would for me be it. And then obviously like the, the logistical challenges of getting the turnaround in the, in the three days um, was always, um, a little bit of a struggle. Yeah, we struggle with that too. <laughs> um, I would say that the, the biggest challenge for me, and I'm displaying a picture um, that I sent to an artist recently, is like conveying sort of the magnitude of the space um, and some of the dimensions when I'm talking to artists about, um, particularly artists who are going to do installation-based works. It's just uh, sometimes diagrams like this one, it's just easier to send and um, and that way they know, you know, this is really, this is what we're working with. And I think, uh, I think that's a challenge, but I also think it's, it can be really exciting for artists to come into a space that has just, has such a tall ceiling and, and such an unusual space. So there's been, you know, there's a lot of creativity that can happen. And, and that's just, it's just a matter of communicating upfront kind of what, 
what what the what what it, what the specs are right and where, where we're gonna go from there um so so yeah so i'm always excited to see and i'm excited looking for i'm looking forward to some exhibitions coming up where we're going to have some more installation based pieces because i think that'll really utilize the space in, in, a, in an unusual way um, so yeah yeah, and one other thing that I'll add, kind of in that same thing, because um, it's been a long time since I've been back. I think it's been like two years. Uh, but one thing that was always just so staggering about it was the upswell of support for all the different types of installations, which was like a super empowering thing coming from the visitor base and the board and the staff. But also, like you're describing, one of the one of the things that was hard about it was there's so many big ideas that you can accomplish in the space um, and trying to fit them all in in a meaningful way was always a struggle like trying to balance it because you can't do you know an exhibit every two weeks so even if you hear about this great idea and it will only work at this time um, sometimes that was difficult to kind of prioritize things How do you display works to create space and movement in a cohesive exhibit? Um, so, so this is the empty barn and I, always, I like to show this picture also because I feel like people don't see it empty very much. Um, and it really is a totally different space when you put artwork in it. Um, I know. I remember when I first did, when I did my first show, I was really kind of blown away by seeing it empty and thinking, "Oh my gosh, how am I gonna? What? What are? We, how are we gonna do this?" And it was it was a happy challenge. Um, so, so one of the things that I always think about when I'm curating a show is the title wall, um, and then inserting moments of surprise throughout the gallery space. So. You know, if someone sees the title wall, obviously you want that to be a strong statement, um, but you also want strong statements throughout the space. And, and so one of the other, you know, kind of avenues in our in our gallery spaces is, is the wall sort of when you to the right. And I don't know if I have a picture of that. Um, that's looking the other way. But so anyway, there's just some moments where you can kind of you're about how the viewer is encountering the works and and utilizing the framing to kind of help you in, in in designing the exhibition so this work on the left um, fits very well within that you know framing that's already created by by the barn itself um, and then of course one thing that we've started doing or one of the things that I've is is putting a pedestal kind of right when you first walk in um, so you kind of encounter a work immediately um, yeah, and then again, you know, the Therese Agnew uh, on the right, thinking about the framing, how the barn can frame different works. Um, and then this is something I was like, kind of actually dead set against, and then I tried it, and uh, it worked really well, I thought. Um, so that was putting a quilt, putting a quilt on the, on the staircase, on the, on the ladder, um, and and actually, then you get you get this you know this trip this triple work uh, which really works well. Um, so just something thinking about playing um, within that space. Yeah, and then in some cases using quilts to again thinking about how people are going to walk around. Um, and so we, we didn't use the scrim this time. We just used the quilts as kind of a, a, a wall, so to speak. And then also thinking about dimensionality. Um, this is something that we're also playing with a lot now, um, with aircraft cable. So I, I just strong aircraft cable between two beams and that allowed us to put the works off of the wall. So to, to put the works forward. Um, so you can see that there. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, when I, for me, it was always kind of uh, the balancing act between the two different types of exhibits that I, well, the three different types of exhibits. One would be kind of like a, a, a pre-packaged kind of one that was coming from somewhere else, like Quilt Me Home, um, where like it was already, all of the pieces were already selected and all that. Um, and that one for me, there's a lot about balancing and, and finding uh, different ways to frame like you would mention. Um, for in-house ones where maybe we were utilizing the collection, that one would definitely, you know, kind of fall on uh, my shoulders or staff shoulders to kind of curate and figure out what we wanted to say, uh, which oftentimes, you know, I relied on the expertise of others um, to kind of help drive me because when it comes to putting the exhibit together, I always struggled with kind of the dual nature of the position where you're going to be the one installing, but you're also going to be the one deciding the narrative. Um, and so a lot of times I struggled a little bit with that. And then the third type would be working specifically with an artist or a group of artists on a thematic exhibit. So either highlighting their work and what they do or coming up with a theme and then putting it together. So for all of that and, and creating movement in each one of those, it's a little bit, it was a little bit different for me where when I'm working with a specific artist and we might be doing a, um, a you know, a, their their history and work, uh, like I did with one of my first exhibits, it was a little bit easier because I could actually speak with them and see what points they wanted to hit on and how we could best organize pieces to go together. Um, with the exhibit like uh, from our collection, which was like the hexagon or the coverlets one, that one was much more technical where it was visually, how do I want this to look? And then this is the basic narrative through the labels. Uh, and then the other one where it's like a prepackaged show, it's kind of similar. Um, but those ones were always a struggle if they didn't give you a good uh, label kind of thing. Because um, they often didn't have a lot of information. Um, but one of the other things, like you mentioned, uh, with the barn being empty, one of the things that I always found pretty interesting was how different it would look when we put the labels up because when it's left uninterpreted with like no label panels, the space looks completely different than once you start putting up the pieces to kind of identify each one. Um, and then adding in the movement was experimenting like you have been, and I'm actually kind of jealous of the scrim idea. That's really good. Um, I hadn't, I, I didn't even know what scrim was back then. So that's probably, uh, you know, I wouldn't have thought to ever do it, but having a backdrop like that would be really good to kind of set the rooms so that you can control the critical path that people follow as they go through. So if you want a big reveal before, and it was like an open, giant open room, you couldn't do it because people could see everything from the minute they walked in. But as soon as you start blocking off sight lines, that's when you can kind of control where your centerpieces are, where your focal points are, and then kind of build out from those. And that was something that we started doing probably after my first two exhibits. Um, definitely during folk art. Folk art was probably the one where I had, in my head, because I had seen all the pieces, um, I definitely knew the, the zones that I wanted, so like the thematic zones, and then how to kind of make those into their own rooms. Yeah, the scrim has been really helpful in terms of, again, creating that sort of intimacy and, and rooms um, within the room. I knew about it because my, my family, most of my family's in theater, so it was. Yeah, well, and I had, I had started working recently. Um, we do a lot of like wayside panels for outdoors because uh, I have my jobs through state parks and um, learning about all those materials from the printer, Scrim was one of the ones that came up and I, then I started seeing how they use it in theater and I was like, ah, oh, if only I had known. <laughs> <laughs> it would have changed. And then also like gels on lights and stuff that I would have loved to play with there. Um, Cause you were mentioning the water exhibit cause you can get gels that the way that the light hits them, it looks like the water is actually moving and stuff. And um, knowing that now it just kind of changes the way that you can think through stuff like that. That's really cool. 
So you did touch a little bit about on, on labels. So how how are label labels different for our institution versus other institutions that you two have worked for? Um, I can jump in. One of the things that was super helpful but also super daunting was that pretty much anybody that came into the museum was going to know more about the fiber art that we were displaying than I was. And so, like, um, knowing that and then knowing what, you know, people wanted to hear, in other museums I've done, it's been much more technical to a point in history, or it's been more narrative uh, to a broader theme. With this one, with, with exhibits there, especially with pieces that were made and they were super, they were super technically um, precise, people would always want to know what techniques were used or what the piece was made out of. And at a lot of art museums, that might be done in one sentence, um, but here they would want it almost like a how-to. So if it was applique, if they used silk, if it was a synthetic material versus a natural fiber, things like that became really important because that's what nine times out of 10 people would ask about. Um, and that, you know, that kind of feeds into um, the narrative of it because you only have so many words that people are going to read. Uh, but when it came to that, you could make that as in-depth as possible and people would read all of it, um, which was kind of uh, good and bad because you learned a lot. Uh, but also if you made a mistake, you were going to hear about it more so than you would at any other place that I've heard and I've worked at. So. Yeah, I think that I had a, I have a similar experience um, coming from an art museum where the, the objective was to list um, being the ingredients, you know, from bigot from most to least and then leave out process. Um, I came in and I'm sure I miss <laughs> people. I didn't mean to, and that, you know, we, process is really important. Um, so I was always trying to like pare it down, but now coming here, it really, people really want the information. They want to know if it's applique, they want to know if it's cotton, synthetic, you know, all that. So I, I think I've tried to be more attuned to that. Um, I think there's a challenge again in the barn because it's, of where to put the label sometimes um, because we did those stands are very helpful um, but you know they go behind they go on this lift and so you know you want to be able you, you want people to be able to read them and so play, placement is key and um, yeah so I feel like labels are always going to be one of those things that are a work in progress um, but we also do the the text panel, which I think is really useful, and that's about um, 50 to 200 words of like an introduction to the exhibition and what you're going to be seeing. Um, so that's the narrative, the overall narrative. And, um, and then, you know, and that also, that depends, we, I change that up based on what the exhibition is. So every exhibition gets its own kind of font and design and thinking through of, of that. So. But here, I think I, I think I put in a picture of our, our label stands. Oops, I may have gone too far. Maybe not. Um, I see a question from Melissa in the chat, and she asked, how did we all learn how to do this? Um, and I will start off by saying that by bugging Melissa, uh, and if a label looked good or not was kind of mostly it. Um, but my education background, I, I went through undergrad and then I did graduate school. Um, and I went through the same program that Devin did at UW-Milwaukee in the Museum Studies um, Certificate Program. And uh, so we had to work a lot and through internships. Um, but specifically, uh, Rick Ragazzi was uh, the... I guess he was kind of the graphic artist at the Milwaukee Public Museum, and he came into our class and kind of talked through some things. Um, 
And when I was working there, I learned a lot. But since then, I've done a lot of graphic design through Adobe projects, um, especially InDesign. And that's really kind of opened my eyes into typeface and how you can kind of set mood um, or set tone uh, through the typeface that you're using. Uh, and that's kind of, for me, that's evolved over time where I think about that more now. Um, and it's kind of ruined me going to museums because as anybody that's worked in a museum, once you go to another one, you're not so much interested in what's going on in the exhibit as much as you are in how they put the exhibit together um, and looking at mounts and things like that. I, I learned just through work, uh, really. I got my master's in art history, um, so I do have a master's, and, uh, but it was not really a, it wasn't really museum studies based. So, um, so I started interning at the Kohler Art Center, uh, and that was really my first curatorial job, and then um, worked my way up there and then came here. So really just through experience, um, but I also, you know, there are a lot of resources out on the internet. The Getty has a great um, booklet on just um, interpretive materials for adults and children. Um, AAM has good good resource. So there's there's definitely some museum standards um, that you know and best practices, and it's, those are pretty easy to to access. All right, we are definitely over our time already, but we haven't gotten to the part of people's own homes. So um, if you want to skip the couple of questions we had left and just go into, how do I display this in my house? So like we've been hanging things, you can hang them on your walls. Here are a couple of different examples of how people have hung things in their own homes. Um, picture frame or picture rails, uh, you can put in very fancy moldings up in your house and use the J-hook, S-hook scenarios um, by installing tracks. Uh, there's always the clamp boards, which we showed earlier, and uh, magnetic the magnet things that they always sell at like quilt expos, but that one I'm always wary of because uh, Quilts are usually pretty heavy, so unless it's a pretty small quilt, I'm not quite sure how those magnet boards would would work with a very heavy quilt. Um, on the next slide, we talk about beds. Um, so you can display them on, on your bed, but one of the things that you need to be wary of are sunlight and pets. So displaying on beds is really great for um, the support of the objects. So in an ideal world, you would always uh, store and display quilts flat, but nobody has that amount of space. Um, so often they are folded or rolled for storage, um, but a great display in your home is on a bed um, and it very much protects it that way. But you do have to be careful of the UV light coming in through your windows and also of any pets that have claws and or dander. Um, and if you do put it on your bed, you'll have to make sure to vacuum it or um, slightly wash it to make sure that dust particles are not also deteriorating it. Um, as far as UV goes, on the next slide, um, there are different types of UV coating you can install in your own windows. We just did this um, about two years ago now in the, well, two summers ago at the museum or one summer ago. I don't remember when Carissa was here. That's my intern, Carissa. She was pretty great. Um, so she helped me install UV coating, which is purchasable at um, most stores that sell hardware goods. So we got ours at Home Depot, um, but almost all of UV coating is only good for 10 years. So it is a limited process, whether that's UV coating that you are installing on your windows or that somebody else is professionally installing, because there are professional UV coating installers. Um, it's not good for your plants. So if you have like an art room that you're displaying a lot of different types of art, you could put it up, but it does filter light. So it can change the way that your art looks on your walls from natural lighting. Um, and so then you have to make that warm light choice like Jamie was talking about earlier. Um, it also can reduce heat in your house, which is super great. And it can also um, create privacy because there is, is a mirrored effect on most of them. Other ways to display objects are framed, but when you put up a piece in a frame, you want to make sure that um, it is acid free that they're using when they're backing your, your quilting pieces or other fiber arts because um, not all backing is created equal when you are framing a piece. So 
So make sure it's acid free. You can get UV proofed glass. Um, if you like that, it will change the color of the piece itself. So um, you'll have to play with that variance and how you want your piece to be viewed. Um, and then beware of high moisture areas. So you shouldn't display something that you would like to keep um, in your bathrooms because bathrooms are often very high moisture areas along with fluctuating heat in basements and on porches and um, other areas like in your kitchens, things like that, that can create micro environments inside of framed, framed pieces. Other ways, like I talked about a little bit, storing your quilts. Um, we do boxed with padding. Otherwise there's rolled storage that, um, when, if you hang rolled storage, it often can pull and distort the fibers. So be careful of that. And then again, make sure everything is acid free. Um, if you don't have any of those options, the museum does sell boxes at the, in our uh, gift shop. Otherwise, um, pillowcases and sheets, as long as they are cotton and uh, white, they can function for storing your pieces. Make sure that you're not storing things in plastic bags. So you might get, you know, your bag of bedding from a store. Um, for the long, for the short term, it's great for storage. But if you wanted to keep a priceless heirloom, don't keep it in one of those plastic bagged beddings. Um, they create micro environments, which can increase mold and increase deterioration. <laughs> I went through that real fast. So we're on the fun part. Anybody have any questions? Feel free to ask us. Um, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and thank you for Jamie for taking time out of his new job to hang out with us and talk about his old job of the past. Um, yeah. <laughs> Everyone is saying it's really nice to see you, Jamie, which we agree. I mean, I see you every Sunday. Yeah, I'm really glad that I got to, I'll have to come back and do another one and then in person eventually. I was going to say, I, as you were kind of talking, I was reminded, um, I think it was Susan Carlson did the 24 crocodile quilt. And uh, yeah. when they had that, that was, she used like conduit, like metal conduit in the sleeve as like the hanging apparatus instead of like a wood slat. But I wouldn't do that because like the wood or the metal, if it gets wet, it can kind of like, it can leach through like the, the stuff. Um, and then the other one was, uh, we didn't really talk about this, uh, but we, I had done a couple kind of, um, like I don't know what to call it. I'll call it like place setting kind of thing or, or like to yeah. just, and that was that was very yeah that was very delicate we there's a quilt top that was a hexagon quilt top that was paper pieced and they used um newspaper it was like from like the 1930s and it still had the newspaper in the quilt so you could still see it and we had displayed that on one of the antique beds um so that it was flat so it was laying because there was no way to hang it because it was too um because it was too fragile so we had laid down you know, white cotton to make sure that all the contact points were covered. So, um, and then Melissa has, what was your favorite unexpected moment with an installation? Devin, I feel like that one would be your berry, the berry for you, maybe? The strawberry? Yes, but I've got the garbage truck, so you talk. Um, when, when we hung the Henry VIII coat jacket thing, um, I was really surprised the way that the light hit it. I was really concerned that it was going to be too hot, like if I had a light on it. Um, that was pretty unexpected. And then the only other one I can think of was when I first did, um, when I first did the folk and, when I did the folk and fiber exhibit and we started putting up the lanes a little bit more. Um, there were like, there was one piece that when it was like on a table, it didn't look great. But then when I put it up on the, on the wall, um, it became like my favorite piece, just the way that it was framed and, and how it just looked. So, um, I think it was like a bridge in Maine was the, was the design of the quilt. So that one was 
that was pretty unexpected that I would like that one that much. Cause like on the table, it just didn't look that, that um, stunning. Um, oh man, I, I don't know. I, every show I have one that I love or multiple ones that I love, I think right now, um, just, you know, seeing all the quarantine quilts have been really, it's been really fabulous. And the mask in particular, that one, I think the way that came together, I, I couldn't really envision it. Um, but I think she did a fabulous job in terms of like realizing the dimensionality of that, of a mask <laughs> around someone's face. Um, and I think, I think that's just really cool. But I mean, every, every show there's something that, knocks your socks off and yeah. Yeah, I really, I think one of my favorite things is MacGyvering a hanging. Um, so somebody will say like, especially a native fiber, Karen Ann Hoffman would say, I want this piece to fly. And I go, okay, we'll make it happen. And it was just um, figuring out how to make it look like it was hanging in a way that it just made it completely beautiful. So like that strawberry, um, that we showed much earlier, that was, we wanted it to hang in between um, the rafters of the barn. So figuring out a way to hang it that was both safe and functional um, and to give it that, uh, I actually, I think I hung that one twice <laughs> the first time we hung it and then I didn't like it. So I rehung it again to make it so that all of our knots were hidden. Um, but kind of jerry-rigging and figuring out how to hang something that's difficult or fragile is one of my favorite things, like the paper pieces we did for water, um, making sure that they just look like they're hanging out of nowhere, or the fish in the entryway. I mean, that, the running of the cable um, was really, was really cool, Emily. Yeah, the fish were pretty great. They were really great. So that's that's how we hang things at our museum. Um, and I like I like that you roll with whatever we're, we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm very easygoing during exhibits. I want this to happen. All right, we'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I remember I like originally had started trying to do like layouts, and it got to the point where the way that the the installs usually flowed, you just couldn't do it because seeing it flat on a page versus seeing it up in the space, just, I think that that probably should have been my answer is just whenever you get it put up and seeing it physically in the space always changes the expectation, like never matched what my expectation was from before. Um, you know, and I think that's just kind of the nature of doing install art installations like that. So thank you so much for all tuning in. Our next program will be Friday, September 4th, and it's about um, being an artist during the pandemic. So. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Bye.